reason to worry, as we now know from the Persepolis tablets, because those Persians brought that whole business with them. They had enough flour, they had enough fruit, they had enough beer and wine, they had enough organization and delivery infrastructure to keep all those lads going, even over the barren terrain of Greece. Nevertheless, the Greeks, being a little suspicious, sent 300 or so of their own lands, <laughs> Spartans, <clears throat> To check out the situation, they were led by a king named Leonidas, but if you find that challenging, you can think of him as Richard Egan. <laughs> See, Occam's razor works in the arts and sciences, too. Entia non multiplicanda sud praeter necessitatem, or don't make things harder on yourself than they already are. So here are these Spartans. They marched up to northern Greece. They were all turned out, as you can see, in their party clothes. They had on their, their hats and their spats and not much else. <laughs> Notice what they didn't have. They didn't have tashim, pockets. Now remember, this is about 480 BC, and the finest minds in pre-Socratic Greece were still working on fundamental problems of almost Talmudic pointlessness. Like, which came first, rock, paper, or scissors? <laughs> As you can imagine, they were a little technologically challenged, and that's why you never, never hear about Spartan Tashim. <laughs> now, I know what you're thinking. Socrates, well, pre-Socrates. You remember Socrates. He's the guy who wrote the motto of the Internal Revenue Service, the unexamined life is not worth living. <laughs> But there's another, another question that's come down from the pre-Socratics to our own day, to the Chicago City Council of today. What about lunch? <laughs> and that's what the Spartans were wondering, too. Now, I have to explain here that the Spartans practiced an early form of population control that involved sending their children away to be killed. This is evidently one of the hallmarks of what we call Western civilization, unlike some indigenous groups in the Americas and Africa and East Asia. Higher Western civilizations do not get rid of the old, they kill their young. And the Greeks built an entire educational system on this practice. So when a Spartan way on his lad to what we might call the checkout line said, but mom, how am I going to get lunch? His mother would say, here, with this or on it. And they used to pull up tubers along the road, chop them up, and fry them on their shields. That's why they were called hoplites, from the Greek word hoplone, originally meaning military equipment or kitchen equipment in general, but specifically meaning shield, or as we might say today, lunchbox. <laughs> So these five million Persian merrymakers are on the way, but they're slow to arrive because, just as if they were an army, they're marching on their stomachs. And their stomachs are very full because they have so much of this very good stuff and they have to pause to digest from time to time. The 300 Spartans, on the other hand, have nothing to eat but this stuff. So they're getting literally dyspeptic, living on fried tubers from a local spot. <laughs> And the only thing they can do is keep their spirits up by telling each other one-liners. Now, you remember that the, the Greeks, the, the Athenians were the liberals of the ancient Greek world, so they were famously verbose and sanctimonious. And the Spartans were the conservatives, so they were famously obtuse but kind of pithy, and so they got all the good lines. So they would tell each other jokes like, say, are these gates hot or is it just me? <laughs> Or else they'd do what lads do everywhere, they'd carve graffiti on the walls. <laughs> That's how it translates. <laughs> the Simonides epitaph came a lot later, but they're starting, of course, to get really cranky. Now here it gets a little complicated, because we now know that the Persians had a hidden agenda. The Greeks, as you remember, were called hoplites on account of their defensive and kitchen equipment. The Greeks were known for like, defending themselves with the kitchen equipment. <laughs> the shield, the hoplon. The Persians, on the other hand, were known for their offensive equipment, the spear. The, per the Greeks called them doryphoroi, literally spear carriers. Now, 
That's uh, the equivalent of an old Persian word, arshtibara, spear carrier. Did I mention that the Persians also invented grand opera? <laughs> now, here it gets a little complicated, so try to stay with me on this. A lot of us took the wrong turn when we translated this word merely on its etymology as spearman or something like that, as you see here. Xenophon, spearman indeed. But our French colleagues, remember our French colleagues, the inventors of semiotics and deconstruction and all that stuff, they got it right when they translated the word dory for us with dory for. This is the Academie Francaise, right? This is the immortals, a term that you may be familiar with from Persian history, by the way. The, uh, French also, the Persians also invented the French. Now that Dory Four to translate Dory Forest, that might not really seem like all that much of a translation to you, but check it out. An insect, a coleopterous insect, a parasite on the potato, or as we might say, the potato beetle. <laughs> yes, that's what this was really about. Certainly not an invasion. Not even just a party. What the Persians were trying to do was to get all that Euro trash off their murderous fried food diet by offering them what? Fruit, cereals, fiber, things that would improve their health and prolong their lives. After all, why do you think the Persian advance guard were called the immortals? <laughs> so what went wrong? When the Persians finally arrived, and the cranky Spartans saw all their good food, Leonidas uttered the cry that is carved on his memorial even today. He's not being too careful about where he holds that shield, is he? <laughs> Molon Labe, the war cry. Literally, come and get it. <laughs> it's true, I don't make this stuff up. I'm, I don't know jokes. So, hearing that cry, of course, the Spartans charged the Persian food like so many professors at a free reception. <laughs> Things got ugly, and the rest, as they say, is history. So for a couple of thousand years after that, Western civilization relied on fried carbohydrates instead of sensible fruits and fibers. And most people died young and stupid without even the benefit of a classical education. What's really astonishing is benign and wise as they were, the Persians just wouldn't quit. They waited a few hundred years for tempers to cool off a little bit, and then they tried a more low-key approach. They sent three magi, as they were called, Iranian wise men, for some back-channel contact with a velvet revolution that was said to be fixing up in the Roman provinces. The old Persian term for this was Iran-Contra. <laughs> it's a bit exaggerated, because it was really just three old guys with a box of sliders, as you can see. And to begin with, this sort of lower key approach started out well. The kid came along pretty well. Um, he had a pretty large following, but it didn't work out. As you can see, he was a great teacher. He was a very popular lecturer but it ended badly because he just didn't publish. <laughs> and that, my dear and sad friends, is how the Persian saying arose that was quoted so often by Hafez, by Rumi, and even by that great Chicagoan Gothi. <laughs> Western civilization never misses an opportunity to miss an opportunity. <laughs> In other words, ex oriente lux. Enlightenment comes from the East, but do you want fries with that? <laughs> now, my worthy opponent showed you a picture of Milton Friedman suggesting that the poor man would turn over in his grave if you voted wrong. And I just want you to know that this is a picture of my dog. And, <laughs> and he's really cute. And he'll be really sad if you don't vote for me. So in the words of the final authority in all of this, some of you may remember him, Latka Gravas, 
Thank you very much.